Charlie, are you ready to go? Yeah, sure. Okay, right. Take it away. Cool. Awesome. Hello, folks. So I'm going to share my screen, which should now be working. And I'm also going to share you a link to the GitHub repository, which is going to contain the lecture slides that I'm using now and also the live code that I write during this session. Uh, so as soon as I finished, I'll uh, push that uh, to the repository. Uh, so, hi. Um, so I work four days a week for Admiral Research, uh, sorry, Admiral Insurance Group, uh, who recently created a data academy and at the data academy I'm responsible for building training courses for our entire data community, which includes data analysis, analysts, data scientists, data engineers, all sorts of people. Um, Admiral is a really exciting place to do data. And if you have students that are looking for interesting places to start their careers, I would definitely recommend Admiral as a place to consider. They uh, graciously are letting me do this in Admiral time. One day a week, I'm an independent consultant on data visualization, and I specialize in R. And I also used to work at the University of Oxford. So I worked at Oxford from 2015 through 2019, and I built an interactive data visualization service called the Interactive Data Network, which you can read about at idn.it.ox.ac.uk. And what this was about was about building a service that allowed researchers at Oxford to build interactive data visualizations to visualize research data sets as part of research, impact, and engagement. And the technology that we used behind this was R and Shiny, which I'm going to talk about today. Now, it's very obvious to me that the other talks today have been about Plotly, um, sorry, have been about uh, Python. And so I'm talking about R, but that's okay because the technologies I'm going to mention, um, well, some of the technologies I'm going to mention, they are available in the Python world as well. So I will talk mostly on R, but some of the technologies that I talk about will be available for you in Python and might be quite interesting if you haven't heard of them before. But before that, I want to talk about data visualization and research data. And invisible data is not open data. So if you're doing research and you're publishing your data and you put it inside of a data repository, that isn't enough. You need to make sure that your data is visible and accessible and people can see the data and understand that it's available. And one of the best ways to do that is with data visualizations. Data visualization is really awesome. It lets us do lots and lots of things. But I want to spend just a few minutes talking about why data visualization is awesome from a data driven perspective. Lots of folks talk about how a, a data visualization must be worth a thousand words because a picture is worth a thousand words. That is not very uh, scientific. So um, thankfully, we've got lots and lots of evidence that data visualization is useful. So there is decades worth of, re of research demonstrating that data visualizations improve comprehension of information. They improve the accuracy of reader measurements and also using data visualizations improves the confidence in understanding and decision making. So I have here charts um, and in this study, uh, folks were given this statement, global temperatures have decreased or stayed the same. And hopefully everybody on this call disagrees with that statement. However, there are folks with a particular political um, uh, alignment that don't tend to uh, understand that this statement is false. And what we have here is information about uh, people with a strong GOP affiliation. Uh, that we're not giving it any information at all, they were just asked whether they agreed with this statement, and more than 50% of people did uh, when given affirmation. However, if you gave that group text, then the response rates, uh, so the, the number of people who agreed with the statement dropped below 50%. And when you provided them with a data visualization as well as text, the number of people who still agreed with this statement dropped to well below 20%. So data visualizations have a demonstrable um, benefit to readers. We also have a history of impact. So these are two data visualizations which were crucial to our development and uh, understanding of germ theory. 
So this visualization on the left was built by Florence Nightingale, and it demonstrated that uh, introducing basic hygiene standards to hospitals decreased deaths. So patient outcomes were improved by washing towels between patients. And on the right hand side, we have a visualization almost from the same year, from 1855 by John Snow. And it's a really interesting visualization. It shows a map with bars showing the number of cholera cases. And using this visualization, John Snow is able to demonstrate that cholera is clustered around this water pump and that local buildings that didn't use that water pump didn't have as many or didn't have any cholera cases. So both these visualizations have a clear history of impact and they helped us build germ theory as it is today. Data visualizations also allow us to tell impactful stories that we might have tried to tell before. So again, this is um, this is climate change data. So we've seen the hockey puck uh, graph lots and lots of times. So this is an alternative way to represent that data. So we have here over time global temperature uh, average per month, and we can see over time it's coming out from the center. This is a really dramatic way to tell a story we've been trying to tell lots of ways before. So data visualizations allow us to tell impactful stories in unique ways. But data visualization is also necessary in order to understand data and to not make mistakes. So just over 50 years ago, Anscom in 1973 published a paper. And in that paper, he had four data sets that shared 10 statistical properties. The number of observations, the mean of the independent and dependent variables, the estimated standard of error, the multiple R squared values. And if you look to own the statistical properties of those data sets, they were the same. But if you visualized those data sets, they clearly come from different populations. And these visualizations today are called ANSCOM's quartet. So for 50 years, over 50 years, we've been trying to make this point that graphical representation of data is necessary to not lose information and to not miss important things about our data. So data visualization is key to understanding what lives inside of our data. And as a modern reimagining of this, uh, the data saw us. So in 2016, uh, this animated GIF was generated and all of these scatter plots all share the same statistical properties. So again, if we don't visualize our data before we do stuff with it, we're going to miss things. And they might be really big things like a dinosaur. And so we want to use data visualizations and we want to use data visualizations in an evidence-based way. And we want to know which visualizations are best, which visualizations can we read most accurately, which ones should we choose? And thankfully, we've got decades worth of evidence to help us select data visualizations. So we have eye tracking experiments, we have experiments where we get large groups of people to, to look at charts and ask which is the biggest, which is the smallest, and what's the relative change between uh, the, the, the groups in the chart. And uh, so this was first done in 1984 by Cleveland and McGill. And since then, we've, dem we've repeated this experiment for tens of thousands of people. So we can, we can say that these results, that there are some things that we perform more accurately than others. This is true of the human race. So this isn't just true for undergraduates in North American universities that have gone through a specific education path. This is true for humans. There are some tasks that we are able to perform more accurately than others, which is fascinating and really interesting. And that's why whenever I get a chance to talk about data visualization, I always talk about this, even if you want me to talk about interactivity. But I'll do that now. Sorry. We should really think about moving beyond dead trees. So printed visualizations are, are dead trees, and we've moved well beyond that. Academic publishing has even moved beyond that, and that's a dinosaur. So interactivity is the new color chart. What benefit does interactivity provide us? Interactivity provides us alternative methods to access data. So I worked on this interactive uh, web application built with Shiny at Oxford. And it's about uh, uh, policies that were introduced by the Labour and, and the Conservative government for uh, uh, families. 
And you can just have a boring list of those policies, but what you could do is you could put that into a Gantt chart, and then you can build that as an interface for exploring the data. So similarly, you can select an element inside of that, and it gives information about the policies in, inside of these large policies. So interactivity provides alternative methods to access data. It allows users to slice through data. So using interactivity, we can filter, we can pan, and we can zoom. So when we come to a data visualization, we can go right into the part of it that makes sense to us. And that's really the overall benefit of using interactivity. Interactivity allows us to combine both summary and detailed information. So we can build a data visualization that makes sense when you first come to it. And then if you want to explore it, you can get more information from it. Unfortunately, there is good evidence to show that most users don't realize that data visualizations are interactive. So if you've gone to the trouble of making an interactive data visualization, it's in a blog post you've built, there's all sorts of things that happen if you move your cursor over it. Most people don't realize that. So if you build an interactive thing, tell people, move your cursor over this, tell them that it's interactive because most web users don't realize that. So at the University of Oxford, we were really interested in destroying the data gap. So the gap, uh, the gap between PDFs and the data uh, in data repositories. So it's, it's it's considered to be called the data gap. And what we want, and we saw interactive data visualization as the way to do that. So we looked at lots of different data visualization services and what most of those visualization services required was was us to go and push our data to another place and to visualize the data from there. But that's very bad from a reproducibility point of view, because that data set is not a canonical data set. The canonical data set is the data set that has a DOI. If we have a, if we have a research output without a DOI, it's next to useless. DOI is the only way to create a permanent long term uh, address for research output. So thankfully, uh, we were able to find shiny. So what we built was an interactive data visualization where there's live data doing things, maybe it's weather data that's being pulled in by a database. And that data set is then being updated on a data repository. So that might be Figshare, it might be Zenodo, it might be the Open Science Framework, or it might be an institutional data repository instead. And then using R, we were able to build Shiny Apps and hosted them on shinyapps.io. And those, those interactive web elements were pulling the data from the canonical data repository. So the people viewing the interactive data visualization were always seeing the up-to-date canonical data. And because of this interactivity, there's a sense there's data somewhere. And so this breaks apart the data gap by using interactive data visualization. So what can we do in interactive data visualization within R? There are three technologies which I want to talk about. There's Quarto, HTML widgets, and Shiny. Quarto is a really interesting piece of technology. Quarto is the next generation of R Markdown. So you may have heard of R Markdown. It's a tool inside of R that allows us to build reports and presentations. Quarto makes Python a first class citizen in its world. So using Quarto, you can build reports, presentation decks, and other things all inside of Python. So you might already be using Jupyter Notebooks, or you might still be calling them IPython Notebooks, as they used to be called. But the issue with Jupyter and, and IPython is there's not a good way to output that as a thing. So you can use it when, 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 when you're teaching and when you're writing a thing uh, and when you're understanding and building and researching your, your theory. But when you want to publish it, when you want to make it into a PDF, where you want to make it into a web page, Jupyter doesn't have good solutions for that. Quarto does. So Quarto allows us to build reports, uh, presentation decks, entire websites, all inside of it. And Quarto has both R, Python, and also Julia, 
as first class citizens. So it's not just an R tool that Python works for, it has been, been deliberately built to work for Python users. So I think I should demonstrate that, right? Because otherwise it's just a nebulous thing. So if I go here, can you still see my screen, Siri? Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cool. So I'm inside of our studio here and I've got a quarto document. So I've got a heading here, I've got some text and I've got some uh, R packages that I'm going to load and uh, I'm going to make, sorry, a bad chart. So I used to be a physicist, so I spent many years doing uh, bad things for maths and I haven't done physics in ages and so my maths is even worse than it used to be. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly look at the msleep data set in R. The msleep data set tells us about uh, the, the sleeping behaviour of various mammals. It's a really nice data set. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a ggplot2 chart of that uh, to look at uh, sleep cycles and REM sleep as well. Uh, so, uh, what did I do? All right, sleep total. So I've got a scatter plot here with sleep REM uh, on my x-axis and sleep total on the y-axis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this uh, by uh, VOR. So those are the different diets in the data set. And I said I was going to do a bad math thing. And so the bad math thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create lowest models for that data. So there we go. I can do that inside of ggplot2 really nicely and easily. And I've got an, a quarto document here where I can write things like Lois is a thing. So that's really great, but that's not really interactive. So now I move on from quarto to talking about HTML widgets. So HTML widgets is this incredibly awesome tool which allows our developers to build wrappers around JavaScript packages. So we've had two talks from people who've used different JavaScript frameworks for building interactive visualizations. And HTML widgets is an R tool that a developer can use to wrap a JavaScript package so that we in R can call that JavaScript framework without having to learn JavaScript which is lovely because I don't want to learn JavaScript. I want to keep in the language that I'm currently in at the moment. So HTML widgets is an incredible tool. And there is a showcase website here that uh, demonstrates the three most widely used HTML widget packages in the R ecosystem. So Leaflet is really very good for making interactive maps. So if you need to make core clef, dot density maps, other things, you can do that using Leaflet. Some of the audience also mentioned earlier Plotly. So Plotly is a JavaScript library and there's an R wrapper for that. So we can build Plotly charts, but we can also do interesting things like visualize network. So if you're working with network graph and you want to visualize that interactively, then VizJS is a beautiful JavaScript package and there's a wrapper for that called VizNetwork and that allows us to do really interesting things. And I think I have one of them here. So this is one of the uh, pilot projects that I worked on um, at the IDN. So this was with some historians visualizing the prosopological prosopological network of people in the past. And so what I can do here is I can select some individuals. Uh, I'll select Menzo as well. And what it does is it builds a little graph for me showing their connections, but I could say, okay, I want to uh, look at the larger network. So I want to increase it to edge two. And then I've got a little network that I can use to explore that data. And I can select individuals from here as well. 
So this interactive thing that I've built here has been built using Shiny. And I've got an interactive network diagram built with this network. So that is HTML widgets, except for the one thing I wanted to show you. So I'm going to store this chart as GG Sleep. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take GG Sleep and I'm going to give it to a function ggplotly from the Plotly library. And what that's going to do is it's going to build me an interactive version of that chart. So if I change it to multi hover mode, it's going to show me information about those series. And what I could say is, OK, I definitely want to get rid of the Insecti uh, data set. So I could do that and it removes that series. I could also say Carney I'm not interested in. I'm only interested in the smaller series. So this interactive chart has been built by creating a ggplot2 chart and handing it over to Plotly. It's really awesome that we can do this. It's not just Plotly that we have access to. We have lots of different HTML widget packages available to us. And you might say, OK, well, how many do we have? We've got 127. So you might be doing brain imaging. Uh, so there's an HTML widget for doing interactive brain imaging. And there's lots of other HTML widget packages available. It's really exciting. And my least favorite thing about the R community is nobody says this word HTML widgets. So you might hear people say that they use Plotly inside of R, or they might say they use Leaflet, and it's missing out this information that there's all this world of other interactive things that we can build thanks to HTML widgets. As far as I know, there is no corresponding technology in the Python world, so it's not as easy to build a wrapper around the JavaScript framework. But it is fairly easy to use R from within Python. So what you could do is you could use the reticulate package from Python to call R code to call HTML widgets to make interactive stuff if you wanted to. Because it's really fun to have as many dependencies as possible sometimes. So Quarto and HTML widgets are really awesome tools, and they don't require a server. Everything happens inside of the web browser. So in Quarto, I'm going to knit my document uh, together. It'll make an HTML page, and I can upload that, and I can put it wherever it wants. And then we've got Shiny. Shiny needs a server with a little asterisk. And so Shiny allows us to build interactive web applications using R. It's a fully self-contained web framework. And what I'm going to do is I am going to build a Shiny app. So I'm going to go over to our studio and I'm going to close my uh, scripts. OK, there we go. And I'm going to introduce you to a lovely function in R called Curve. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to visualize an expression. So I can visualize x to the power 2 here. So I'm going to build a Shiny app to do that. So I'm going to go and create a, a UI for my Shiny app. So I'm going to make a web page that takes the full width and full height of the browser. And for right now, I'm going to put Hello World into that web page. And then I need to go and build the brains of the Shiny app, the server side of things. So I'll do that by creating a file called server.r. So I build myself a function, and then I run my Shiny app, and that's all the code I need to build a web page with Hello World in it. So now I can go and start adding some elements to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a slider so that I can play with the exponent of my chart. I'll choose the min value, max value, and I'll choose the default value. I'll run my Shiny app again. So now I've got this slider here. Great. So now on the server side of things, I'm going to build my chart. So I'll build something called curve plot using render plot. 
I'll add the code that you just saw me use in the console. There we go. Now I've created that object on the server. I need to visualize it in the client side of things, so in the UI file. So I'll run that Shiny app. And now I've got Hello World, I have a slider, and I have a chart below it. These aren't connected together so far, so I changed the slider and it doesn't change the values. That's, that's disappointing. And that's really easy to fix. I can go over to the server.r file and I can change this to input dollar exponent, save it, close my app, run it, and now I have a shiny app to interact with. And it's this easy to start to build shiny apps. So what I am trying to decide next is whether I should show you a slightly more complicated Shiny app or not. And I think I will. Actually, no, I'll give you time for questions instead. Uh, so, Shiny is really exciting because we can build an entire web application using R code. We don't have to learn any HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and we don't need to set anything else up. It's all written in R code. There was an R package released recently uh, called Shiny UI Editor, and this allows you to build up the design of your Shiny app uh, interactively. But then we need a place for our Shiny apps to live. We've got three different places that we can put Shiny Apps. So there's shinyapps.io, which is a fully hosted solution. If you want to roll your own stuff, then you can. So there's an open source Shiny server application you can install on a server that you can control. Or you can go and pay our studio some money for content management system for Shiny Apps. Shinyapps.io is the easiest thing to demonstrate. So if I do that here, oh, I do it like this. So shinyapps.io is really easy to use and it comes with a free tier. So you can sign up for a free account for shinyapps.io. It limits you in how many ap applications you can have running uh, at any one time and how long those applications can be used per month. So only 25 active hours per month. If you're teaching a small module with a small number of students, this might be enough for you to get away with for free. The pay tier is not that expensive. The University of Oxford's uh, visualization service, they pay for two sets of the professional tier um, to serve all of the visualizations that they have. And that also allows you to do authentication as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign up to it right now. And I'm going to make use of the infinite email trick. Uh, so 2023 uh, 0517 at gmail.com. OK, so I'll sign on up. I'll choose my account name, so I'm going to choose Jolly J Hadley 2023-0517, so I shouldn't be stealing that from anybody else, nobody else should really want that. And then I'm going to go and get this piece of code from here, copy it to my clipboard, shove it into our studio. There we go. Now I'll run my Shiny app, I'll click on the publish button. And we can now see all of the different app, um, accounts that I have. Uh, so this is the one that I just set up, 2023-0517. And let's call this Talmo. And what that is now going to do is it's going to grab all of the packages from my local machine that this Shiny app is dependent on. So if there's private packages that I've built 
that they're going to be seen. All those packages are going to be sucked up and put onto shinyapps.io. They'll all be installed. And then all of the files on the local machine will also be put up onto shinyapps.io. This process, oh. Okay, that's not going to like me because of the quarter document. Okay, uh, right. So I'm not going to be able to do that demo because uh, I've got a quarter document inside of here. It's not happy with me. Um, but that is how easy it is to sign up for shinyapps.io. So we can create a free account. We can connect our studio to it uh, using using your secret like this. And then if I hadn't made things complicated by putting lots in this project, I could have deployed that Shiny app uh, directly. Uh, maybe I'll do that um, and add that to the, the Git repository uh, later. But I guess I did have my quarto document here. So I've got my quarto document. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to render that into HTML. And so this is the report that I wrote. So I've got my text up here. Um, I've got my uh, I've got my uh, capitalized <laughs> heading here. I've got less as a thing. Uh, I've got my uh, interactive chart as well. So using Quarto, I can build a document. I can uh, render it to HTML, and I can do this in Python as well. So Quarto will feel very similar to how you use Jupyter but it also gives you the ability to actually output content from it. So that might be HTML, it might be PDF. So you might choose to write your entire academic journal article in Quarto, generate the PDF and send that over to your publisher. That's something that you can definitely do. Okay, so let me get back to this. So we've got shinyapps.io, which is a place where we can publish shiny apps and it's all maintained and done for you. Um, there's then our Studio Connect. So our Studio Connect builds your content management system for shiny apps and also for quarto uh, documents as well. So you can programmatically generate reports according to a schedule or trigger, which is really interesting. You can decorate APIs with R code using Plumber and have them live on R Studio Connect, which is really very interesting. And Shiny for Python was recently uh, made uh, non-alpha. So it was alpha recently, um, and, but on the 18th of April, uh, they finally put it into a state where it's considered stable. So I'll put that link directly onto here. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to write Shiny apps directly in Python. So the code looks very similar to what I wrote before. So I use a fluid page uh, in my R code. There's page fluid over here. You can see this hello world. I created myself a server with three objects inside of it. And then I ran my Shiny app. And so we can now in Python build Shiny apps. And we can also host those on shinyapps.io. So you can build Shiny apps in Python and you can publish them to shinyapps.io or to RStudio Connect if you wanted to go down the commercial route. Uh, this package, this framework in Python has been built with Python in mind. So it's not a straight, which it just changes from, from R to Python. Python developers have been involved in its development, so it will feel like Python, but it will be using shiny principles for you to build reactivity. You may have used Jupyter, not Jupyter, you might have used Flask before to build interactive content with Python, but Flask has dependencies you need to set up and it's just not as easy to use as Python. So I definitely get, recommend, can, can recommend looking at Shiny for Python. And if you have an hour and a half to spare in your life uh, to uh, watch one tech talk, I would recommend it be this tech talk from Joe Cheng. Joe takes you through an emotional journey of his through building Shiny, seeing what people do with Shiny, how it was used during the pandemic to coordinate uh, data and dashboards. And he talks about the future of Shiny and how it's available in Python. And what's really exciting 
is WebAssembly is a new technology which allows us to run arbitrary binary code on a user's machine through a web browser. And what that allows us to do is that allows us to run arbitrary Python or arbitrary R code on a user's machine. Uh, so if I get here, show me live Python. So Shiny Live is a way for you to build a Shiny app and to have it run on a local machine. So there's no need for that Shiny app to have a continuous connection to a web server. Instead, all of the Python code or R code, if we were in R, that is all put onto the user's machine and it's all running in a web browser, which is really exciting, really interesting. And it's going to make the interactive visualizations that we're capable of building with R and Shiny even more interesting in the future because there's no need for a server. So that means we don't need to pay money, um, maybe. And uh, it's just generally easier for us to build stuff. So that's lots of things. If you're interested in learning about R for interactive visualization and Shiny, I have six different training courses on LinkedIn Learning on this topic. If you're employed by a UK university, it's more than likely that you have a subscription to LinkedIn Learning through your uh, institution and you can access these courses for free. I've got a five and a half hour course about HTML widgets if that's interesting to you. There's also a two hour 50 minute course about Shiny. So that course was written in R and I will be making a Python version of that in the near future. Uh, so that is a quick commercial thing. So hopefully you don't mind me mentioning uh, that. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is stop talking and invite folks to ask any questions that they have. <coughs> yes, there is a there is an equivalent of Shiny Life for R almost. So Web R in the browser is um, is basically um, the R solution for this, but it's not as far along as as Shiny Live. Shiny Live, you can use right now. I'd still consider it alpha, um, but WebR is even more alpha. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, more questions for Charlie? To raise your hand and unmute. Good applause, thank you. Um, so I guess my, my question is, um, so a lot of the, the audience will be looking at this from a, a teaching and, and learning angle, right? So in your experience, what, what um, is this kind of more if you are using R in your teaching already and you have to deal with a lot of statistical um, teaching um, I mean, from, from the teaching community, is it mostly people who teach stats? Or can we do other things with it? So R has this reputation of just being used uh, for stats. It's a general purpose programming language in the same way as uh, Python is. Uh, it's got lots and lots of packages which are designed for folks who don't have a tra traditional computing background. So one of the reasons we have HTML widgets is because we don't have folks with such a CS bent as in Python. Uh, so that's kind of why we don't have it. Um, but quarter means you wouldn't actually have to learn R. So from a teaching point of view, I would definitely recommend, I'll get the website up for it. I'm sorry, I didn't take that before. I would definitely consider looking at Quarto as a supplement to, to teaching that you're already doing. So you might be using Jupyter in your, in, in your course assignments. You could switch to Quarto very easily and then what you can get, get, get folks to build is a report. And in that report, they can have interactive charts to demonstrate their understanding of a concept. And then when they submit, they can submit the quarter document, the .qmd uh, file, and also the HTML file. So you can see that they're building something which works, which is really nice. 
Quarto is installed if you update R Studio. So if you have a version of R Studio from the beginning of this year onwards, it's installed for you. It's a command line interface tool. So once you've installed Quarto as the CLI, you, you have it available to you in Python and in R as well. So within R, it's, it's talking to the CLI. It's not actually an R package. Does that answer your question, Siri? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. So I, I'm really before. excited about Quarto. It's it's really exciting. I've loved working with folks who use Jupyter, and they they have been jealous in the past of our Markdown because our Markdown allows you to generate the output as well. So it's not just an environment where you're writing stuff. With Quarto, you can output things as well, which I think is really cool and really exciting. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I have a module coming up which uh, requires um, students to submit um, a Jupyter notebook, but I think putting it in Quarto will make a nice web page and it's much, much more accessible. It's awesome. And you can also get them to push that to a GitHub repository as well. Yeah. So when folks are, if folks are applying for jobs outside of academia, I can't recommend enough get your students to have a GitHub profile with some example code on it. So if you have a final year assessment where they're generating reports, if they do it in Quarto, they have a GitHub account and a GitHub pages, that will be really useful for them when they apply for jobs. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank I will so take much. that advice. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. If you have more questions, or Charlie do put them in the chat and she will get to them, I'm sure. Yeah.